Okay. Okay. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we continue in the afternoon with Varish Tamash on the acceptable use of internet and categorizing the web at scale. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for attending our talk, acceptable use of the internet, categorizing the web at scale. Uh, my name is Tamash Varish, and I'm a data scientist with SOPAS AI. First, let's go through the agenda of the talk. It will have na four main components. First, we will go through the motivation, why, <clears throat> why we are doing this project uh, within SOPAS AI. Uh, in a nutshell, we think that the security profile of our organization is heavily dependent of the content uh, their employees browse. So we find it really important to understand that content to the best of our uh, capabilities. To do this, we propose a machine learning model for URL classification for downstream uh, systems. So this will be a defensive apl application of ML. Uh, we, we propose to use ML to do this because the internet is huge and highly vol volatile. So <clears throat> it will be an infeasible task for a human to, to do. Also, even though the URL is not tightly uh, related to the content the page is serving, it still uh, holds valuable signal. And it's a very lightweight artifact uh, that can be used more easily than a HTML or, the, or a portable executable file. Um, then we will go through the model that we are proposing to solve this problem. Uh, we will go through the architecture of the model and the intuition why we propose to use this. And finally, we will go through the results in terms of accuracy and coverage. And finally, we will hand inspect some of the samples. Um, let's look at the problem. Uh, more closely. Uh, let's say I'm a sysadmin at uh, my organization and I go in Monday and I see three URLs in the telemetry of my organization, so essentially URLs that my colleagues looked up. So on the x-axis we have the URLs that my colleagues looked up and the uh, y-axis we have my happiness level about those URLs. So when I see the first URL, it's a security playbook PDF from Microsoft.com, so that's like fantastic. Kudos to, to my colleague. Uh, I'm over the top happy about that. Uh, the second one is a um, less known domain. It's called Tricks for Winning the Lottery PDF. Like, I'm not that happy. Like, I guess I'm not judging, but whatever. And finally, I can see in the logs that someone looked up uh, Pirate Bay and uh, downloading a, or trying to download a PDF. Now, Pirate Bay is a, a torrent site, so that's intellectual theft at best, or maybe that's not even a PDF, so that's how I get ransomware. So it's a sysadmin, but what will I do? I will just simply block that URL in my firewall or my UTM. Now, next day I go in again. Uh, I see the winning the lottery PDF, so it might not work. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I can see that same PDF is still, by, still being downloaded from Pirate Bay, except it's from a slightly different URL. So this is an issue. So that's it. I had it. I blocked the whole domain, the Pirate Bay. Next day, I go in again. And I can see that it is being downloaded from a different torrent site. So it looks like we have a bit of a cat and mouse game on our hands. And the question that we are trying to answer is that, is this a game that we can win, or is this a game that we should be playing at all? So let's do one more exercise. Um, here we have a plot which says bin domains by lookup count on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have lookups co covered in telemetry, so let's unfold what this means. This is a bar plot, it has bars. So if we look at the very first bar, it's produced by taking a sample from our customer telemetry, uh, taking all the, URL, all the lookups from the customer telemetry, grouping the lookups by the domain, and taking the first 100 domain by this kind of popularity. So if we sum up all the lookups from the top 100 most popular domains, and if I have some kind of information about those domains, it will, and, and I block it in the UTM, allow list, block list in the UTM, then I'm, it's really good news. I covered a lot, really a lot of, of, of the telemetry of my customer base. So if I do this exercise for the next, next uh, bin or next bar, 
for the same amount of work, hand labeling 100 uh, domains or URLs, I, ca I get significantly lower uh, return of investment. And we can see there is an exponential decay. So at one point, I will just simply uh, run out of time or patience. I will just give, give this process up because it's simply not worth it to hand, hand, hand label stuff. So let's say I, I gave up hand labeling uh, or blocking stuff in my firewall after the first, I believe these are first 40 bars, so that's 4,000 domains, most popular domains. Yeah, uh, and the question is, will I be surprised the next day I, I, I go into the office? Will, will I see any other funky URLs passing this kind of block list whitelist approach? Now, the answer to that is that probably yes. Because I, if I take the rest of the telemetry and sum it up uh, as the last column there, it turns out that the long tail of the URL lookup distribution is actually really long. So it's simply infeasible to take the most popular domains and, and just assign some kind of label or, or knowledge to them. Uh, how, how does it translate to our actual coverage this exercise? Um, so this will be a plot that you will be seeing um, more after this, but on the x-axis it has uh, the time. So for every day, this plot represents for every day how many u unique URLs were looked up by our customers for, for this 100K sample. And the solid orange color means that, that we had some kind of uh, information about those URLs, and the dashed one means that we, we have no clue what the customers are browsing, which is uh, clearly not good, so that's a, a blind spot. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not as a, not necessarily one-to-one -one map to the top end domains, but it's not the best strategy after all. So what do we mean by labels? Uh, internally with Sophos, we track 80 labels. Um, I track, uh, I show nine examples of that 80 labels here. Uh, these labels or URLs belonging to these classes could have impact um, on the organization along multiple dimension or aspects, so there is one important, which is the security aspect. So there are uh, trusted update sites like Microsoft.com or search engines, Google, or, or there is Tech Overflow, which is something that probably you are not going to get infected from or, or less likely. And to, to the bit right of that, there are the social networking sites. You can argue how risky it is, but it's more likely that you will get infected from a Facebook link or a Dropbox link than, uh, than, than from a trusted update site. And <clears throat> then on the far right, we have the um, extreme categories, which is pornography or drugs. So th those are just simply infested with malicious content. So you might want to pay uh, more attention to those URLs. <clears throat> and then there is the other aspect of uh, all this, which is called, which is we call the negative impact of productivity or negative legal uh, impact or ethical impact. So there are these low sites which have no product, negative productive impact because we need, need, to, need those to do our everyday job. But then it's up to an organization whether it wants to allow its employees to browse social network sites during work hours or dating sites. And for, for sure, no company wants to allow employees to browse pornography or, or buying illegal drugs during work hours. So this is sort of the motivation. Well, why we are tracking these classes. So just to recap the motivation part, what we are <coughs> trying to do is we want to use a machine learning in contrast to the standard approach, which is having analysts hand labeling a few sites that cover a good chunk of the telemetry, but not all, because it leaves a lot of unknown data. <coughs> um, this, uh, this manual labeling approach we want to replace it because it's really slow, it's expensive, manual work doesn't scale at all, and we want to use ML instead of that, uh, specifically to provide extra labels for our long tail that manual labelers couldn't cover. Uh, this project has additional like side effects where it reduces time for label to new sites. I, I mean, whenever you de deploy the model, it will be instantly there, so you don't have to wait for the whole pipeline to get to the analysts and it could also highlight uh, conflicting labels, but uh, that's for another day. Um, generally, if you use uh, ML, you would want to split your data into two or three groups. Uh, the first group being the training data that will be used to tra train your machine learning model, and the other 
two or three is the test of validation data where you will evaluate your model how well it was trained. We use the so-called time split <clears throat> with which we want to emulate a deployment scenario, meaning that we pick a point in time, which is roughly end of January for this scenario, and we take everything before that time as training data and everything after that as test data. Uh, we use 200 million URLs as our training data. <clears throat> Uh, and one, one detail to highlight is that there are no duplications between the training and test data, which would be still a realistic scenario because people still can look up URS from the past, but we are not really interested in how well the model can generalize between URL lookups, but sorry, not interested how, how well it can memorize, but we are interested how well it can generalize for lookups. Uh, but uh, domain repetitions are allowed, but not, not for URS. <clears throat> so, now that we have our data and our labels, the only thing we need is, uh, is our model. Uh, we propose to use a 1D convolutional neural network for this task. Uh, there is the, on the left, we have the architecture of the model. It has fundamentally three main blocks. One is the character embedding, then the feature detection part. And finally, the classification. So just a few quick words about it. The input to the model is a URL as a string. So it needs to be, uh, the ML operates over numbers, not on strings. So we need to convert that uh, in, uh, strings into numeric representation. We choose uh, one the uh, character level embedding to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's an existing concept. There are many ways to do this. We choose to go with that. So what that does, it takes every character of the input URL and it maps it to a numeric vector. Every, char every character to a learnable numeric vector in a way that characters that occur in a rep replaceable fashion, so like num numbers are alike in a URL, so it's it not necessarily changing a number, it's not necessarily changing the meaning of the URL. And then, then those similar characters, similar characters with similar rows would be mapped to similar numeric representations, so that's probably enough about the input part. But this, this makes, it, make, makes this model more robust to obfuscation attempts if you just want to type more, more numbers at the end of the URL. And, and then the mo most interesting part or the key part of the model is the feature detection part, <coughs> which consists of 1D convolutional layers. What a convolutional layer does on a high level, it operates a sliding window on top of an input. Uh, strings are fundamentally one-dimensional, so there is an example on the right for that. We have the casinobathlib.net uh, as an input URL. It is converted into its numeric representation by the embedding layer, and then we set a, we pick a convolutional window that we will slide over this string. So essentially, if we set out the key equals three, so a three-line convolutional window, it from the beginning with the step size one, it will slide over all the URL, so it will capture the numeric representation of cas, rc, sin, and so on. So essentially, it will capture all the three-length substrings of the URL. Uh, now, we do this with uh, window lengths two, three, four, five. So for example, window length four, it will capture the every four-length substring of the URL. But with the th length three, it will capture bat, and with length four, it will also capture game. So these are important because with a human eye, these are the very words or subwords that drive the human eye that's saying, hey, this is a gambling site. So among, among the, all the substrings, these will be captured too. And all these features will be fed into the classification layer, and it will assign weights to these specific features in a way so it, uh, um, it gets the best possible probability or, or accuracy at the end. So how to evaluate a model as such? Um, there are many ways to do that. I'm showing one. This is called the rack curve. Uh, rack curve shows a trade-off between, between the false positive rate and the true positive rate. Uh, this, this plot has three lines on it, uh, three curves. So for example, if we look at uh, the orange line, there is a dot at 10 to the minus third false positive rate. What it means that for every one in a thousand URLs, 
that are not in the healthcare site, we will make a mistake and say it's a healthcare, a healthcare site, which is not good, but it is a price that we have to pay that we get a decent true positive rate uh, roughly on the roughly on the 90 percent mark, which is a pretty good result. Uh, we are doing well, for example, with the pornography category as well. So these URLs turns out the healthcare and pornography is something that are really explicit even in the URL, but, but, but they will be hosting. And of course, there are more generic categories like personal cloud apps, which is hard to, hard, hard to decide what they are about, but uh, it's still an OK result. But how does this uh, translate into, into the actual deployment? So we had this uh, plot before with the covered and uncovered data. So first, let's see how the track curve translates to the labeled part. So it turns out if we apply our model, uh, for each, lab co each, labeled co each labeled part, we get the corresponding model predictions where we can evaluate our model. The solid blue is the URLs that we got correctly, and the light blue is that we got incorrectly, which is, this, this is an all right result. But this is not where the, where we would expect this model to gain value from, because this is something that we already knew. So let's see how we do on the, on the unknown part. And it turns out we can roughly half uh, the amount of un unknown data that we had in our telemetry before just by deploying this model and it picking up spe specific uh, subverts. And looking at the ratio with which the model got the URLs right, it kind of gives hope that the pink one, the additional gain from this model will be also uh, good, uh, with good, good accuracy even though it's a harder problem. Uh, These deep learning models are fundamentally black box, so as of now, we don't really know why they make the decisions that they make. Uh, there are multiple tools to po post up models that um, are used after the model training to explain the first model's dis decisions. Uh, one is called Lime, so we are showing uh, results here from a, from a post up model called Lime. Um, on this plot, we have two set of URLs. One is the um, high scoring previously unknown examples, so that's, that's the net gain from this model, and then the high scoring mislabels, which is the failure mode of this model. First, let's go with the high scoring unknown examples. So uh, the first URL is movie7.to series, and it was predicted by the model to be an intellectual piracy site. Now, with Lime, if we feed this URL into Lime uh, with our model and its predictions, what Lime uh, high level does, it splits the input into tokens, permute, permutes the tokens, and it assigns probabilities for, to each token, like how, how much the contribution of that specific token is to a specific class. So the, the deeper the color is on, on that uh, right picture, uh, the tokens contribution to the class intellectual piracy is higher. So the highest contribution is that movie seven token, which is, I, I would say, it's a fair, fair uh, token to pick up as a marker of the intellectual piracy side. Also, the series one is highlighted. So uh, it, it seems like this convolutional concept uh, is working out. And then we have the democraticstrategy.org, which it's likely to be politics, and finally the pokerstars.in, which is obviously a gambling site. And uh, there we have the other set where, where we made the mistakes with the model. So the first URL is forksoverknives.net. So on the right, we can see that the model looked at the word knives and immediately said it was a weapon site, whereas in, in reality it was food and dining, so I would say this is a fair mistake to make. Then we have the word cancer day which was uh, predicted to be NGOs. Uh, in truth, it was a healthcare site, so this should have been called. So sometimes it, it, it just not, not capturing the proper uh, subwords. And finally, this is the mode where you would expect a URL-based model not to perform so well, is the study.com, where the URL has not, no, no, 
no signal whatsoever but it will host. So unless you knew that study.com was a hosting site, you, you stood no chance with this model to predict that it was a hosting site. So that would probably explain why we, ha we still have uncovered data in our telemetry even after uh, utilizing the model. But even with that, we, we get, uh, get nice-looking URSS extra coverage. Yeah, and with that, thank you for your attention, and please, if you have questions, ask. Thomas, thank you. Do we have any? Yep. So I was thinking, what is the next step to fine tune this? But how would you be able to fine tune? Because you are focusing now only on the URLs. Do you want to focus or, or add more content based on the words, pictures mm. on the web pages or? So the main next step is that um, <coughs> this system access a pre-filter. So obviously there are methods that we want to try, want to try like different models. But I would say if we are looking at it as a system as a whole, the next step would be implementing a model that takes in a HTML from the URL. And that would provide a more so that's a trade-off. So downloading and scanning an HTML and predicting on an HTML, it's mo way more pricey. But uh, using this model as a pre-filter, then feeding that to an HTML model, that, 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 that's the next step for this project. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask a quite practical question because uh, I'm working with content uh, filtering software and testing it and so on. And what I see so far that even with this uh, kind of AI introduction, it is still not real, still not uh, near how the hum hum human uh, people trying to interpret the page. So I would like to ask your opinion when we will get to the point that instead of classifying any domain saying this is a major site, this is a gambling site. Instead of that, the classification software downloads the page, interprets the text with machine learning, uh, interprets the pictures, audio files, video files on the page, and it actually can say that, for example, this download, this part of the, the, of the pirate-based site is a free textbook, Therefore, you can download it, and it's, it's a completely fine. But for what is content, it says it's highly uh, inappropriate. Therefore, it is classified as a torrent site. So you are not allowed to uh, open this URL in your browser when you are working in a corporate environment. Thank you. <clears throat> so I would say. Machine learning is there, but there are more aspects to machine learning than just the model. So there are two key other aspects. So one is the data that you use to classify. So my answer would be first that if you think as an ML model as a compiler and the data as the code the compiler executes, then, then we need better code, we need better data. Uh, so that's one part, and the other part is that uh, the hardware is not there yet. So there are models that are pretty good at, uh, at, uh, at classifying all these things that you ask. It's just pricey to get the data for it and to run it for everything. But I would say the algo is there, and I think maybe 10 years. <laughs> but it's not really for me to say that's just my personal guess. Uh, I have a simple practical question. Why three is the magic number? Because I realized that in another product they also took every three consecutive characters and, and built their mm -hmm. model based on that. Why not four characters? Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we have uh, actually four, four of those layers. So if we take every two, three, four, and five substrings. And why that? It's empirically. So someone tried six and someone tried one, and we arrived at the solution, okay, this, this is where it made sense. But no, 
practical reasoning just with, with right with all. Okay, that seems to be it. Tamash, again, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.